Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is August 19th, 2016, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, the State Department blames the media for its own lies and deception over the $400 million Iran deal. Why all the beating around the bush the if it was such a great and noble decision? So evil, start, evil reporters along. have made you we dredge this up? Then, Hillary Clinton finally talks to the press. Well, sort of. After reading a brief statement, the media was promptly escorted out of the room, and no questions were allowed. Plus, Bill Clinton's sexual assault victims unite against NBC's propaganda puppet, Andrea Mitchell. Bringing up a discredited and long-denied accusation against former President Bill Clinton. All that, plus the long list of Hillary lies, up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Two days ago, U.S. Air Force Secretary Deborah Lee James told Sputnik regarding the 50 to 70 B-61 tactical gravity nuclear bombs stored at Incirlik Air Base in Turkey, we do have nuclear weapons and those nuclear weapons are safe and secure and we are confident in that. Now, Debka is reporting, the United States has begun secretly evacuating the tactical nuclear weapons it had stockpiled at the southern Turkish air base of Incirlik and is transporting them to U.S. bases in Romania. Is this a reaction to the failed coup, or is there a larger strategy at play here? As this reaction finally comes after the worst foreign policy administration in U.S. history remained quiet as power was cut to the Incirlik Air Base and was put on lockdown while hordes of Turkish protesters gathered outside the base over the purported CIA link to the recent coup attempt, a link that winds its way back to Fethullah Gulen and his movement. The the same Gulen who is protected by the Obama administration and maintains a charter school empire in the United States that has angered labor unions while siphoning money from the American taxpayers through those charter schools to fund his movement. The results of the failed coup in Ankara, Turkey that claimed 294 lives and saw thousands arrested has awarded President Erdogan unlimited dictatorial control over his country. The New York Times reported Turkey said on Wednesday that it would empty its prison of tens of thousands of criminals to make room for the wave of journalists, teachers, lawyers, and judges rounded up in connection with last month's failed coup. Numerous sources are now confirming that the Incirlik nukes are being moved to the Devesilu Air Base in Romania. Meanwhile, 2,000 NATO troops have conducted airborne training operations in Poland, while Obama pledged 1,000 extra troops to Poland. Russian President Vladimir Putin is urging Erdogan to pick a side as the proxy situation in Ukraine, funded by the United States. We've invested over $5 billion to assist Ukraine in these and other goals that will ensure a secure and prosperous and democratic Ukraine. Is it possible that the, that the majority of the civilian casualties that you're talking about uh, were actually civilian casualties that were, that were the victims of the Ukrainian army and the oligarch that uh, financed one third of their army at one point. Is that possible? If I, if I could say two things. First, I think it's highly unlikely on the basis of the reports that we've received from the United okay. Nations and from the OSCE. Second, I want to underscore again why this conflict started. It started because Russia moved troops okay. uh, and Russia, weapons and so forth just, into just Eastern Just so you Ukraine. know, Madam Secretary, the Russians would suggest it started when there was a violent overthrow of an elected government. Right. Now, I don't make it, a, our, make it a point of listening yeah. to President Putin's claims as a general yeah. rule. I don't find well, them credible. Well, I think that you are our representative. You should pay attention to everybody's claims, and you should refute them if they can be refuted rather than dismissing them. And quarterbacked by George Soros, an escalation now forcing Putin's hand as 40,000 Russian troops are now sitting sitting on the Ukraine's eastern border. Our media and government should be working to de-escalate this nuclear powder keg with rational reporting and diplomacy. However, Obama golfs, Hillary thumbs her nose at Putin, and George Soros sways public opinion to lead the world to the razor's edge of World War III, just in time to hijack the U.S. presidential election. John Bound for Infowars.com. That was a fantastic report there from John Baum. 
Now let's talk about something that's been labeled a conspiracy theory here lately. Uh, you guys recall that over the past couple of weeks, uh, the 400 million bounty to Iran had been speculated on and people in the media saying, oh, it's just a conspiracy theory by the right wingers. They're making this up. They're trying to demonize Obama. And now the State Department blames the media for its own lies and deception over the $400 million Iran deal. In a remarkable exchange with the press corps, a State Department spokesman was berated and questioned for half an hour over blatantly obvious lies and deception concerning the Obama administration's $400 million payment to Iran. Getting away from the word leverage, which um, in basic English, you're saying that you wouldn't give them the $400 million in cash until the prisoners were released, correct? That's correct. And I love how easy it is to convince so many people of what constitutes a, quote, conspiracy theory. Basically, when I talk to people and I ask them, you know, what is a conspiracy theory, it's just something that hasn't been confirmed by their trusted source. Let's say, for example, if your trusted source is CNN. If CNN isn't reporting on something, but InfoWars is, it's a conspiracy theory until CNN gets around to reporting the exact same information that we may have said years in advance. A similar thing when you deal with government types. When myself, Joe Biggs, David Knight, or whoever else, we go out to these press conferences and we talk to these police chiefs or these lieutenant colonels or whoever they may be, and we ask them a question that may be in conflict with their press release. I say, just read out the press release. And we say, no, sir, your press release is in direct contradiction with what your actions are saying. Your motivations aren't in line with your actions. And if you do this in a public setting in 2016, they call you a conspiracy theorist. Have that, so those same press conferences happen back in the 1960s or 70s. We'd be given awards for award-winning investigative journalists. Uh, that's just how mentality is, and it's the great pro propaganda machine where you just keep people so docile, so afraid to be labeled something that they won't even ask you a question, and you eventually have to get the people to admit it themselves, which they usually do in some type of fashion. It may have been years later or whatever, but they eventually do come around to admitting it, and then it's a fact, even though somebody could break the story, you know, potentially years in advance. Now, as we're talking about the press, let's talk about media not talking to Hillary Clinton or Hillary Clinton not talking to the media more accurately, because we know Mrs. Clinton has gone well over 200 days without directly having a press conference. Now, she may have, you know, little puff pieces. We can come up here and ask her a simple question. Or you can take a picture of her, you know, hugging kids and kissing babies and all that kind of stuff. But recently she had in an event where she invited the media to come and film her talking to police officers, but not the police officers responding to her. Yeah, well, we, but you know, they, they can sit down. Yeah, can they come? yeah, bring your chair. Can we get, uh, Jake, can we get more chairs so that, you know, uh, everybody who's here feels like they can be part of it? So with that, I'm going to let the press have a chance to uh, depart, and then we can begin our conversation. <laughs> so you get two days off, huh? Two days? And that's the beauty of it. So she can sit up there, she can give her speech, she can say whatever she wants to say, but let's say if, uh, for one example, uh, somebody in that press conference with her on that panel had a opinion that differed with hers. Well, we're not really gonna find out about that now. Just like when she had all these big meetings and press conferences or uh, these speeches to Goldman Sachs and these other big banks, and people saying, well, why don't you release the transcript? Well, <laughs> well yeah, we, don't, we don't need to talk about what I said to all these big banksters who's giving me money all, all the time. And as we're still on this Clinton train, let's talk about her use of the personal email server. Now, as I always say about Mrs. Clinton, in the grand scheme of things, I think Benghazi is a much larger issue than the email scandal, but we have seen the head of the FBI come out and say that Mrs. Clinton did put national security at risk when she used these private email servers. And I love this, this mentality that people have. Well, she did it, so it's okay if somebody else did it, or somebody else did it before her, so it's okay that she did it. I'm not saying it's good when Colin Powell did it. I'm not saying it's good when Mrs. Clinton did it. I think they're all accountable in their own way and everybody should uh, be held accountable for the actions. But now we have a report saying that Clinton told the FBI that Colin Powell advised her to use a personal email server. And this is the Democratic presidential nominee, Hillary Clinton, told federal investigators that Colin Powell, a former Secretary of State, advised her to use a personal email account according to the New York Times, and they did say that Colin Powell said, except in cases of classified communications. Now, as I was saying, it's not good, good when Powell does it, it's not good when Hillary does it, but that's what everybody uses the excuse for. I'm gonna make up this excuse for Hillary because 
people have done before her. She's supposed to be different. Same thing with Obama. He's supposed to bring the hope and the change. He's supposed to end these foreign conflicts, still have foreign conflicts. He's supposed to shut down Guantanamo Bay, still have Guantanamo Bay. He's supposed to stop arming all these terrorists and these criminals, still arming the terrorists and the criminals, and then sending our guys out there to go and fight. Do you understand what I'm making, the point I'm making here? You're, if your guy is supposed to be different, they're not supposed to do the same things that the other guys have been doing for years and years and years. And speaking of things that have been going on for years and years and years, the allegations of one Bill Clinton. Now, recently, myself, Joe Biggs, and Rob Dew, we had a chance to go up to Milwaukee following the civil unrest up there with flat-out riots. Let's call it what it is. Uh, following the shooting of a man up there. And a lot of people have differing opinions. I've yet to see the official police video, so I'm not going to speak so much on that aspect of it. But basically, the thing had settled down by the time we got there Monday night. So with that a little bit cooler, cooler heads prevailing out there, and very good to you guys, Milwaukee, if we're uh, squashing that down and not letting it become a larger issue as far as the violence is concerned. Uh, Trump was also speaking in the Milwaukee area about 30 minutes outside of the city. So with things cool in Milwaukee, we went up there to the Trump rally. Now, while I was out there, there was a small group of anti-Trump demonstrators, and I guess Trump has figured this thing out. He doesn't want a bunch of violence and flag burning and people throwing barricades at police and the horses out there. So he's getting a little bit smarter and not having his rallies in the inner city where people could take a bus so they could walk down there and cause a bunch of ruckus. When we went out to Milwaukee, his uh, facility was kind of out there in the sticks. I think the only thing in the immediate area was a hospital. Didn't look like there's any public transportation where people could just get off the bus or up there and protest. With that said, there was a smaller group of Trump demonstrators. And a lot of them were just, you know, soccer mom types. And I felt this was an opportunity to go engage them in conversation. And you guys know how I feel about Trump, but I can actually articulate to you why I feel that way about Trump or Clinton for that matter. And I was curious as to why these people were anti-Trump. And when I engaged them in conversation, they would say something to me to the effect of, I don't like Trump because he's a sexist or he said negative things about Megyn Kelly or Rosie O'Donnell. And yeah, he did those things. I'm not justifying him. I, he has a freedom of speech, but you know, so I'm not encouraging anybody to go out there and do that. Um, with that said, I said, okay, so he said this about this person, about that person, but you have Mrs. Clinton who has called Bill's rape accusers, Bill's bimbos, and you guys don't really seem to be too concerned about that. Oh, well, nobody's perfect. That's the justification I gave you. That's just what I was talking about Clinton and Cole and Powell. It's not okay when Colin Powell did it. It's not okay when Clinton does it. So if you want to call Trump a sexist because he said something about Megyn Kelly, but then give her a free pass when she calls these uh, accusers, bills, bimbos, there's something wrong with that logic in my personal opinion. Now let's look, take a look at this article. Clinton's sexual assault accusers Paula Jones, Kathleen Wiley unite against NBC's Andrea Mitchell. Wiley and Jones are demanding that NBC news anchor Andrea Mitchell issue a, issue a public apology for basically claiming that Broderick, another Bill Clinton rape accuser, was discredited during a segment on the Today Show. And this is following a letter from Broderick's attorney. Now, NBC has deleted references to it in its internet version of the report, but they have not fulfilled Broderick's request for an apology. And this is what they do. They'll just go out there, they say anything they want to say, and then they just hope that nobody on the back end catches up with it. And this is what I tell people. I'll say this, you know, in some of the newer guys that are coming to the office. A lot of times people remember the first thing that they hear from the source that they believe, whether that's true or not. And people can make honest mistakes. You know, I definitely don't bash people for that. But when you come out and say that something as heinous as a rape allegation, you're discredited and you need some actual proof to come out and say something like that. And this is what I'm saying. Like when they build this wall of protection around Hillary, you can say Trump's misogynistic, Trump's a sexist, he's a this and that, he doesn't pay his people, you know, his, his wife is naked on the cover of magazines and all that's well and good. But if you bring up how old Billy Boy has been accused of, for decades of raping women, you're just anti-Hillary. You're just not ready to see a woman in the White House. Now, somebody who you won't be seeing in the White House, this is Paul Manafort. He has resigned from Trump's campaign. And Donald Trump's outspoken campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, resigned on Friday, and this is amid growing speculation about his ties to Ukrainian politics. He came under fire in a New York Times article saying that from 2007 to 2012, he had received over $12 million in undisclosed cash payments from a pro-Russian party. Now let's talk about celebrity news, but not in the way that you're thinking about. Mike Rowe, the guy from Dirty Jobs, he's coming out and he's speaking about celebrities and their involvement in the political system. And of course, everybody has the right to choose their candidate of their choice. But somebody asked him, Mr. Rowe, you know, will you encourage your 
your followers, your viewers to go out and vote. He says, no, I'm not going to tell people to vote just because they have the right to vote, just like I wouldn't tell somebody to go out and buy a gun just because they have the right to buy a gun. And he made a very interesting point. He was talking about uh, all the celebrities who tell their fans to go out and vote, but they're really telling their, their fans to go out and vote for their candidate. He's saying all these big celebrities like Leonardo DiCaprio and Ellen and the rest of these guys, they want you to go out and vote for somebody like Mrs. Clinton. They don't want you to go out and vote for Trump. Just like when you see these ads from these Democrats, I remember the one, I could, it was like the turn down for what, that had Little John and Lena Dunham and a lot of those celebrities in it. And it's like, yeah, just go out and vote. And then the whole thing was about gun control and uh, legalizing marijuana and a bunch of other things. And I'm not saying all those things are bad, but the point is like, go out and vote, but we're gonna tell you how to vote. It's not like vote for yourself or vote how, who you want. Vote, but vote how we would tell you to vote. And that's how celebrities manipulate the public. And just one big thing about propaganda, and finally, we'll go with this NSA article before we come back with more special reports. NSA leak is real, Snowden documents confirm. And this is on Monday, a hacking group calling itself the Shadow Brokers announced an auction for what it called cyber weapons made by the NSA. And they said Snowden has been able to come out and authenticate this information saying yet this was an actual tool used by the NSA. And uh, there's been a lot of talk about who's going to be in Trump's cabinet. I personally would like to see Trump add as the head of the NSA, John McAfee, so John McAfee can shut down the NSA. And he said, hey, I'll just give you a free copy of McAfee antivirus software and you can figure out the rest for yourself. That's it for this segment. Stay tuned after this break for more special reports. Well, this just in, the Clinton Foundation has announced this week they're gonna stop taking donations from foreign governments and from corporations in the event that Hillary Clinton gets elected. Also, the, Cl the Clinton Global Initiative is gonna shut down entirely in November, regardless of the election's outcome. And in any event, they say they're gonna wind down. One last gathering in September, the former president told his staff. Now, an article coming out rather under the wire, and I wanna point out that this is prompted by Trump's tweets regarding the Clinton Foundation, how corrupt that she is, crooked Hillary, and her donation policy if it's elected. Now, Clinton's family foundation, they said that they're no longer going to accept foreign and corporate donations. And that's a big deal because the bulk of their money comes from places like Saudi Arabia, Oman, Kuwait, uh, places with an atrocious human rights record when it comes to women and gays. And uh, upwards, I was looking into this today, upwards of 25 million the Saudis gave to Hillary Clinton, their foundation. She's saying, by the way, that her hands are clean. It was just given to her foundation, not to her specifically. All while she was acting as Secretary of State from these autocratic Persian Gulf states and their leaders potentially undermining her candidacy and her claims that she could carry out independent Middle East policies as Secretary of State even though she was taking money on the side from them. That remains to be seen how she's gonna justify that. Anybody else doing this, by the way, would be in jail right now, but because it's Hillary Clinton, we have to give her a free pass. Now these Persian Gulf sheikhs, uh, one article suggests that they gave Bill and Hillary upwards of 100 million. There's a video attached. This Daily Caller article, it came out in May, and we're tying it with this now because of this announcement that they that they released on Thursday that they're gonna stop taking money from these states. And these donations, they coincide with her employment as Secretary of State. We know that she used it as her personal hedge fund. These regimes, no question, were buying access. That's what's on the table. You've got the Kuwaitis, Oman, Qatar, the UAE, Massive conflicts of interest nobody seems to be pointing out. Now, Clinton greeted the announcement of the end of her Global Initiative Fund as uh, no admission of wrongdoing. She's saying that uh, her hands are clean in the event. Remember, they released their tax returns not too long ago. And to justify that amount of money coming from foreign states, well, let me, let me, my hat's off to her. Let me put it that way, that uh, the woman is not in jail right now. Now, the foundation has been the source of headaches for the couple for years, but the fact that Bill Clinton is saying that uh, they're going to go ahead and wind this down now because of all the speculation that's been pointed to the foundation and its donors, um, it's, it's truly an act of suspicion. And here at InfoWars, we like pointing out suspicious activity, if you haven't noticed, and the fact that this foundation, we've covered her at nauseum here, the fact that it says it's winding down, that is a blaring red flag. Now, going to the AP article for just a moment that, that highlighted this rather innocuously. Now, Hillary Clinton maintains that she stepped down from the initiative's board after launching her 2016 campaign. 
Her husband, Bill, and of course her daughter, Chelsea, remained in leadership roles on the initiative, prompting questions about the ability of the organization to continue its work should she become president of the United States. Now, this article, it's written highly favorably, highly favorably towards Clinton. And it really, it's very bothersome to me because looking at the specifics of this case, this woman has been taking money from foreign corrupt governments for years, governments that have a track record of violently abusing women, gays, throwing them off buildings, in fact. And yet this woman maintains because she's female, she belongs in the White House. This is some sort of historic moment as though, you know, Jill Stein and, and other women don't exist. You've actually run for the presidency. Regardless of that, Clinton is saying nothing to see here, even though her relationship with these dictatorships continues. My question is, what kind of favors did she swap while a secretary of, of state maintaining this policy, this innocuous policy of, of having, you know, a fair and balanced take on, on engagements with, with countries like the UAE, with the Saudis, with Kuwait, with Qatar, with Bahrain, all of which have donated to her, what kind of relationship should, could she have maintained while taking their money? I'm Margaret Howell reporting for Infowars.com. It just couldn't be any more arrogantly brazen. Hillary Clinton has been cleared by the FBI for the heinous breach of the United States national security. Our investigation looked at whether there is evidence that classified information was improperly stored or transmitted on that personal system in violation of a federal statute that makes it a felony to mishandle classified information either intentionally or in a grossly negligent way or a second statute making it a misdemeanor to knowingly remove classified information from appropriate systems or storage facilities. And consistent with our counterintelligence responsibilities, we have also investigated to determine if there is evidence of computer intrusion by nation states or by hostile actors of any kind. Now I have so far used the singular term email server in describing the referral that began our investigation. It turns out to have been more complicated than that. Secretary Clinton used several different servers and administrators of those servers during her four years at the State Department. Email was assessed as possibly containing classified information. The FBI referred that email to any government agency that might be an owner of that information so that agency could make a determination as to whether the email contained classified information at the time it was sent or received or whether there was reason to classify it now, even if the content had not been classified when it was first sent or received. And that's the process sometimes referred to as up-classifying. From the group of 30,000 emails returned to the State Department in 2014, 110 in 52 email chains have been determined by the owning agency to contain classified information at the time they were sent or received. Eight of those chains contained information that was top secret at the time they were sent. 36 of those chains contained secret information at the time. And eight contained confidential information at the time. That's the lowest level of classification. Separate from those, about 2,000 additional emails were upclassified to make them confidential. Those emails had not been classified at the time that they were sent or received. Although we did not find clear evidence that Secretary Clinton or her colleagues intended to violate laws governing the handling of classified information, there is evidence that they were extremely careless in their handling of very sensitive information. Hillary Clinton used her Secretary of State position to set up a drop box for her million dollar clandestine espionage Clinton Foundation operation. That alone should have taken down Hillary. However, she and her husband have been dodging persecution long before her rise under Obama's reign. He should have been impeached and convicted and then I think subsequently charged with treason um, for these two transactions. In essence, uh, he ignored U.S. law to uh, trade high-level technology to the Russians, 
But even more egregious, he essentially took $300,000 in illegal Chinese campaign contributions, passed through uh, Johnny Chung uh, in return for their th a three-party transaction in which he, he sold the actual technology that targets our missiles, the accuracy of our mix missiles to the Chinese government. By any other name, this is treason. The elite are writing their own declaration of independence in the legacy of their puppets of globalism. And the shot has been heard around the world. Paul Joseph Watson writes, Many Americans reacted furiously to the FBI's announcement that Hillary Clinton should not face criminal charges over her email scandal, with some asserting that since the former Secretary of State appears to be above the law, they would also now refuse to follow follow the law. One respondent asked, why should we follow the law when our leaders don't? This Clinton BS has sealed the deal for me. We are ruled by a corrupt cabal that is above the law. Attorney General Loretta Lynch has already said she would abide by the FBI's recommendation. Of course she will. She orchestrated it illegally right out in the open. Make no mistake about it. If Hillary is elected president, she will bring with her decades of protected criminal activity, a state of mind that she will unleash on the founding principles of the United States of America. This is how America dies. John Bound for Infowars.com. Uh, this is Ben Garrison. He is a political activist cartoonist. Um, he's a commercial artist, fine artist, and a libertarian cartoonist. Now, he says he was very angry after the 2008 banker bailout, so he decided to draw protest cartoons in his spare time. He began by drawing anti-Federal Reserve and pro-Ron Paul cartoons. You've seen his work. He has very iconic anti-New World Order artwork. But now it seems like, uh, Mr. Garrison, you're dead set on taking out Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, um, Normally I'd be drawing a lot more anti-Federal Reserve cartoons, anti-big government, anti-forced um, vaccination and things such as that. But right now it's imperative that we keep this creature from returning to the White House because if she gets it back in there now, I mean, who knows what kind of junk she'll pull on the American people. I mean, she could end up doing some stuff that would make Hitler and Stalin blush. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, there's kind of a tenet in journalism. When you're chasing a story, if everybody zigs, you zag. And so it appears like that's exactly what you're doing with your artwork, because a lot of people would probably go after what they perceive as the low hanging fruit which would be Donald Trump. And we're seeing a lot of this artwork making fun of him. Oh, he's, he's naked, statues uh, are being put up in New York and, and things like that. Um, but you're, you're going after the topics that the media doesn't wanna talk about, Hillary's health, how the election was rigged. Uh, let's first just get into one of your latest cartoons, Weekend at Hillary, uh, where you're, you're basically showing how she is having to be propped up and dragged into this election. Well, this cartoon is factual. It's not that much of an exaggeration. I mean, we've already seen it with our own eyes. And um, some people or some doctors out there are even starting to say that she has the early onset of dementia. Well, we know, we've known for a long time that she, she's already had uh, severe dementia when it comes to ethics. She's got ethics dementia. <laughs> so I drew this cartoon to, to um, illustrate that. That's more of an illustration rather than yeah. just fact to me. <laughs> I mean, just look at her. She can hardly go up the stairs, and she's uh, she's um, got to be you know, propped up on pillows. She she's got her stool, <laughs> right? So now she's taking the weekend off. She's taking the weekend off, and Obama's golfing while uh, while Trump is uh, going down to Louisiana to uh, help out the flood victims. What does that tell you? Exactly. And, and in fact, they've even said that they don't really want President Obama coming to visit them in Louisiana just yet because he takes so much preparation. He would take all of the police that are there trying to help the families in need. They would have to go protect him. So they're like, don't even come. We don't need you right now. And I, I love how with this with this cartoon, the points that you're making is that Hillary, without the DNC, without the mainstream media, without all of her handlers, her presidential run would have expired. It should have expired. She's unfit in so many ways, in multi-dimensional ways. Uh, she's not fit physically. She's not fit 
when you look at her track record, it's been a series of disasters, and she's not fit ethically. She has uh, a long, long history of bamboozling and and um, and uh, <laughs> tricking the American public. Yeah, you're you you're someone. never going to run she's out. Is what she is. She's a criminal, and 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 she everything she does, she leaves a trail of, of scandal and uh, yeah. Ethics violations and it's just you're it, never going to run out of material when it comes to hillary clinton now ben i wanted to kind of get your take as a libertarian cartoonist who now says you're actively working to make sure hillary does not get her monstrous hands on the white house what do you think about the never trumpers who would rather have someone like hillary clinton who is completely opposite of their supposed conservative ideals. They'd rather have her give her four more years to wreck this country than get Trump in. This is uh, something that I've been trying to discuss with my few remaining liberal friends. I've had three separate liberal friends write me and say, I don't like Hillary and you're right. We know she's a liar. She's a good liar, but I have to vote for her because Trump is a loose cannon. They all said the exact same thing. Trump is a loose cannon. And so my retort was, well, don't we need a loose cannon when the corruption is becoming so obvious? It's like on display and in your face. It's time for a loose cannon to get up there and try to blow out all the garbage that's been deposited in, in the White House and, and on Capitol Hill for so many years. And so that that's what I tell them. But uh, they still insist that she's got experience. I said, well, she's an experienced criminal. And what, look at the disastrous record she had as uh, Secretary of State. Look at all the, even as a senator, she managed to get um, into trouble and uh, was censored by, by the Senate. So to me, the obvious choice is Trump. Now, is Trump a perfect candidate? Of course he's not. Ron Paul was the perfect candidate. Mm -hmm. But Trump, actually, I, I believe he sincerely cares about America and he really does want to make it great again. Whereas Hillary will get in there and continue the cronyism and pocket filling of her of her corrupt buddies. That's what she's going to do. I mean, do you think the leopard's going to change her spots when she gets into the White House? No, she's going to be even more emboldened. And that's why that's why we got to keep her out of there. No, and that's why I'm going to continue to draw the cartoons to uh, to to try to uh, sway sway a few minds. Now, when I drew that Brexit cartoon. To my surprise, I had an avalanche of people writing me, mostly from England, and they said that that cartoon influenced them. And it's like I broke a logjam. They're actually able to start talking about um, how they objected to uh, the EU abuses as well as forced immigration by uh, Muslims. And so, so my cartoon sort of triggered that uh, conversation. Whereas before, they were afraid that they'd be called racist. They're afraid that they'd be say, "Well, I'm a hater." But when I drew that cartoon, it, it showed up everywhere in Europe, and I'm still selling a lot of prints today. It's like um, that's what a cartoon should do. That's what a successful cartoon should do. It should sway minds and and at least the very least generate debate. And so I consider that cartoon is my most successful cartoon of the year. Absolutely. And so, I mean, just like I was saying earlier, these are the things that people need to be sharing on Facebook, on Twitter, are these political cartoons and these memes. They're so powerful. It's so easy to just hit send or, you know, a retweet or something like that to really get this message out there to let people know that it's okay to ask, what the heck is wrong with Hillary? Why does she seem so unhealthy? Why does she have to take days off? from her speeches? Why does she need stools to prop her up? Because she can't even stand. Uh, she's trying to get the debates to be a sit down debates just because, just so people won't see how weak she is on her feet. Um, does this frighten you at all that we have such a powerful media protecting her and, and you're kind of working at this from a, with cartoons? <laughs> Well, I try to watch all sides of the media. I mean, I've even I even watched a lot of CNN during the primaries, and um, it's just it's just disgusting how the the uh, the media is supposed to be a watchdog, but now there are there are attack dogs for Hillary. And within, a, I'll give you an example. With one 15 minute segment on CNN, I heard them call Hillary historic at least a dozen times, and at the same time, they kept calling Trump divisive. So it's a really a form of brainwashing. They're hoping people are 
so stupid that they could play this Jedi mind trick on them, you know, and, and suddenly they're going to vote for Hillary despite all her, all the obvious crimes and corruption that trail behind her. And so this is what's so important about alternative media. And increasingly, a lot of young people, they're not tuning into these uh, major mainstream media channels. They're going to get their news from alternative media where they could actually find some some truth and, and some actual investigative journalism, which isn't happening on the mainstream media. They're just uh, carrying the carrying the ball for the uh, New World Order uh, installments. <laughs> The selections. It's not really an election. It's a selection as far as the, the Democrats go. Look how rigged it was. I mean, look how they stole it from Bernie Sanders. Uh, I heard that he, he may have probably even won in California, but they rigged the, the election, the primary rules, so that the uh, superdelegates have the final say, and thus they strip away the voice of the people. Now, in this cartoon that you're showing here, my older brother actually supported Bernie and actually sent him some money. And my older brother is featured on the upper right. And so I included him in there. And this has to be the biggest political backstabbing in history, the way he suddenly went with her. And that's it for our show tonight. We do encourage you to go to prisonplanet.tv and get yourself a free trial. You can see the nightly news, the special reports, the rents, all right there on prisonplanet.tv. I'm Jakari Jackson from the InfoWars Command Center, and we'll see you again.